do you want to start a business, get out of the office, achieve happiness and success while crushing life? This is Boss to Boss, the place to be for that extra motivation to get up and follow your dreams while learning from the ones who have already done it. And now for your host, Miro Wieslow. Welcome to Boss to Boss. Today's guest is one of Australia's leading entrepreneurs. Having built three successful businesses from scratch, she is a highly sought after business consultant, mentor, speaker, and best selling author of her book, Position Me. She is named a top 10 female entrepreneur in Australia and has been featured in way too many publications for me to name over here. Jemima Ashley, how are you doing today? It's a pleasure. Hey, thank you so much for having me. So grateful to be here. Yes, yes. Like we were talking earlier, you're actually time traveled and you're in the future. And I am. It's uh, it's really lovely here. It's a bit rainy, so I just want to warn you. Yes, you're 16 hours ahead in the, into the future. That's crazy. In Australia, um, actually, this is a boss to boss exclusive. You are the first guest that I'm recording a live episode with that is in Australia. I've had a few other oh. countries, but Australia, it's the first. Yeah, I love that. that. And I also love that I'm actually, am I the first person that's time traveled as well? Because that's also awesome. Yes, yes. Nobody else has actually done that feat yet. You are the first. Amazing. Guy. Amazing. <laughs> uh, for everybody that's uh, that's tuning in, that's uh, following this show, whether you're watching it on YouTube, Facebook, or just listening on a podcast, the good old fashioned way, be sure to follow, follow Jemima at, on Facebook, it's Jemima Ashley AU. Or on Instagram, Jemima Ashley, just one word together, or you got a website, JemimaAshley.com. And it's Ashley spelled with L-E-I-G-H. Not yeah, the, my parents yes. made it impossible for anyone to ever find me, um, and I would continually forever have to spell my name. That's okay. I love that. You know, I I'm, I usually, I like to, my, my short name's Miro, and then when I like to give people the, the easier version, it's Miro Slaw. So... And then you get my full name, Miroslav Kashmir Wieslow. And that's fine. That's fine. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, it's good. It's great. Yeah, right. It's well, a, it's, it's a good you, one. Yeah, you get it. It's the weird name club. I get it. Like you yes. have to continually spell your name forever. It's amazing. I get it's it. Amazing. Position me. How 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 am I gonna how can you help position me? I'm, oh, sure, you, nice. I'm sure you get answer asked that question. Well, here you are on the spot. Uh, so yeah, so I'm positioning expert. So what that means is I look at business owners who are doing kick ass things anyway, who are already an expert and basically make them extremely visible out to their audience because, you know, it's great for us to have all the greatest content in the world. It's great for us to be the expert that we are, but other people have to be able to find us. So that's my job. So I do that in a multitude of ways. So we might look at social media. We might look at your digital marketing. We'll look at you know, podcasting, this is a great example of how to build a profile and how to build an audience. Um, we would look at, you know, how do we get leads into your lead bucket? So, you know, what free downloadables have you got? Have you Are you looking at writing an ebook? Are you willing to write a real book? Are you potentially looking at wanting to do speaking engagements all around the world? And then we do training on how to do that because there are so many people who call themselves speakers, so few people who are very good at being a speaker. Well, that's a good way to put it. It's uh, it's kind of like so many people that are calling themselves entrepreneurs, and then there's only so many that are actually doing the things that make you an yeah. entrepreneur. Yeah, and it's a really it's a dangerous thing at the moment that social media has glorified mm -hmm. entrepreneurship. I'm here to unglorify it and be like, it's a lot of work. People are like, oh, I want to work for myself. It's going to be so great. I'm like, this is the only career in the world where you work an 80 hour week to avoid working a 40 hour work week. <laughs> It's crazy. Like, and we just don't sleep and everything is sweatpants. And I'm I'm fine with that. I accept that. But, you know, we were joking off air about time, time travel. And here's the thing. Like, I do a lot of travel for work. I do a lot of international speaking engagements. And it's it's exhausting. Like, it's really lovely. And travel seems amazing. And this job seems great. Such a low buy-in. I create an Instagram profile and I put the word entrepreneur there. And so, therefore, I am one. Are you, though? Right. I uh, mm. I could go on for days about you know entrepreneur stories, quote unquote. Mm. 
What what have been some of your? You say you go you do a lot of international speaking. What are what are some yeah. notable? You have any events coming up or one that was notable maybe that passed? Yeah, so I just did um, a bit of a speaking tour in the U.S. actually. So I had the opportunity to speak in Los Angeles. So that was pretty incredible at Creative Supernova, which was phenomenal, and took the stage with people like um, Frank Schwitz from um, the co-creator of Make-A-Wish Foundation. I took the stage recently with uh, senior Barack Obama's – she was the one of the um, senior advisors, Valerie Jarrett. So, you know, these speaking engagements are one of the easiest ways to get noticed very quickly because if you get good at it and you have an understanding of how to deliver a decent keynote – and how to stand on stage and how to be silent on stage, it is incredibly powerful and such a great positioning tool. So, um, yeah, so LA was amazing. I just had the most amount of fun. I would live in Los Angeles in a heartbeat. I'd only done the touristy side before, mm-hmm. and I was like, I don't like LA. This is terrible. Oh, my goodness. I saw a totally different side, and I loved it. So you you saying speaking, you know, it's so important, and I think it is too. I, I believe yeah. just any face-to-face contact or just putting yourself out there <clears> – <throat> It th- that goes a long way. What about for a lot of, you know, a lot of us, maybe some of the listeners here where speaking isn't that easy. You know, it doesn't just, it doesn't come as easy and we've had uh, some anxiety issues maybe per se. Would you have good ways that you got over it? Did you ever battle anything like that? Yeah. So look, speaking for me was, I always enjoyed speaking. So I'm very aware that I'm in that 1% of people who, you know, people fear public speaking worse than they fear death, right? This is the statistic. (laughs) So there certainly is. I didn't, I I definitely won't classify myself as someone who, um, who was ever really truly scared of it. But yeah, there are times where I found it uncomfortable. So the trick is for this, you don't start with an audience of 2000 people. Let me be clear here. You start with an audience of 10 or 15 and you get used to doing that. So this isn't, you know, you don't take the stage with, um, President Barack Obama's senior advisor or, you know, the creator of Make-A-Wish Foundation or the creator of Thank You Water. You don't do that Uh -uh. first up. It's a slow build. Like, so that's a hundred speaking gigs to get to Uh that big one. So there are a couple of tricks that you can do that. There's a couple of speaking hacks. There's something called the power pose, which is kind of like standing in a Wonder Woman style. um, Yeah. Like a Superman kind of style. It actually increases your testosterone rate, lowers your heart rate. Yeah. And there's a couple of breathing tips and stuff. And I've definitely still get nervous going out on stage and there's a bit of anxiety that kicks in as it should. This is a little bit of a scary uh, position. Yeah, absolutely. And you have to change the mindset of that. If you are just truly really terrified of it, you don't have to do it. This is the great thing. Things like video is a great compromise if you don't want to do it. But more importantly, if you do want to build it, there are tons of ways that you can get on stage. Toastmasters is an amazing thing that you can go and do and just get practicing with. The other thing is go and do some improv classes at your local improv hub. Toastmasters, can you, can you, for, for the, for, for the ones that don't know, can you get more into that? Mm. Can you explain, elaborate? Yeah. So Toastmasters is, um, I'm sure it's just not Australian. I'm sure I heard someone speaking about it in LA. It's just an opportunity where you can go in and learn how to public speak. So if you go into any of the meetup groups, uh, meetup.com, or you jump online and you can find a bunch of places like Rotary and Lions, they often have public speaking classes. They also are always looking for speakers. So that's the other thing. You can just come in and talk about whatever you want to talk about. Networking groups, same thing. They always are looking for speakers. Mm -hmm. So it's a really good tool. The other thing is if you are really terrified of it, I cannot, cannot recommend that you um, enough that you go and do an improv class. Just go and do a couple of startup ones because they take away the idea of failure off the stage. They act, The whole thing with improv is you you are applauded if you fail. It's funnier if you Mm -hmm. fail. It is. And it really takes away. If you're on stage and something goes wrong, I did improv for a long time, so Mm -hmm. I really think I really credit doing improv to being the reason that I can take stage Hmm. and start talking. My PowerPoint stopped working in LA. Looked at the screen, I was like, I could see it fine on my screen because <laughs> you often, as you get more advanced as a speaker, there's often like a screen in front of you. Yeah. There's a timer. Like there's a few things in front of you. Also, you don't can't really see the audience. The, the bigger the audience, the less people you can physically see due to lighting issues. So, you know, when you've got 200 people in a room, that's scary. When you've got 2,000, you're like, you see four. You're good. <laughs> like you're fine. Yeah. Um, yeah. The bigger the audience, the less you see, right? So 
I remember standing on stage and looking up and going, that PowerPoint's not working. And the whole audience was like, no. <laughs> I went, okay, so I'm just going to walk you through the one I can see. And I kept making jokes about how fantastic and beautiful the PowerPoint was and everyone was agreeing with me. You know, I'm not going to let a failure that's happened. I can't control that, Mm -hmm. but I have a job to do right now. So this is, you know, learning how to roll with the punches is incredibly important, especially if you want to take the stage or build a profile. And this just happened uh, during the last speech you were at? Yeah, yeah, last last couple of months, yeah. And then I asked the question on stage. So um, there, we've talked about this before, Mary, but um, there are some language issues between Australia and the US, (laughs) and there are a few words that perhaps mean different things. I'd like to give mm-hmm. you one now. Thong here is something we were in our feet. Um, so, the, you know, there are times are where... Are like the, 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 the... I'm talking about like the little flip-flops, right? Yeah, of course. Right? Flip-flops, Thongs? exactly. <laughs> yeah, so we wear those on our feet. Thongs go on your feet. So, yeah. uh, you know, I've had some confusing conversations, but my favorite one was I was I was talking about, you know, because I don't like to do the off-the-cuff stuff. I don't like the rigid PowerPoints. I don't like just to follow, read the PowerPoint. So one of the conversations I had was like was talking about a conversation I had earlier and I'd asked the question to the audience. I was like, so it's kind of like what's your equivalent of like the Girl Scouts but the boy version? Huh. And do you know the answer? The Boy Scouts? Yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so this the entire sounded, audience wait, wait, goes. Is this supposed to be a trick question? Because I really was no, thinking about no. this. First. No, we have we have cubs in Australia, so it's okay. like it's like the Girl Scouts, but the boy edition. And the entire and I was like, "What's that called?" And the entire audience goes, "Boy Scouts." I was crying, <laughs> like I was I was like, "That is a, the funniest joke I've ever made on stage," and I didn't make it. How dare you guys? You can't let like some people would be like, "I'm so embarrassed by this." I was just laughing at myself, going, "Well." And the audience had a good time. That's the difference between a decent keynote and a great keynote. I can have memorized a thousand words or I can give the audience a really, really fun time. And everyone kept walking around past me going, Boy Scouts, you nerd. It's like, yep. <laughs> Sorry about that. That's yep, good. That's like, good. I found That's... the only word that translated very well. Sounds like it was a memorable one. Uh, yeah. For those that don't give as many speeches you know, or talks, like when you give, when you, when you use a joke like that, do you have to like, do you have to say that, oh, this joke was from somebody else? Like, is that something you have to, I don't know. Do you no, have to? So the rule, we, the rule we're speaking is about, um, we say there is about an 85% truth element. So we often see with keynotes, people kind of will elaborate or exaggerate different things. And that's okay. Mm-hmm. I'm very all right with you doing that. Um, and it's generally in the community, it's fine. What you can't do is just make a story up. So generally we say, it, you know, you if you if you rip someone else's joke off, that's not terrific. Hopefully you can write your own stuff. But you can say, you know, I had this hilarious story. This is what happened. Those kind of things are fine, but don't claim it to be your own. Got it. Okay. All right. Yeah, because uh, this is definitely a lot of things that I'm sure the listeners and even me, myself, I'm over here like, all right, all right. I can, I can. <laughs> Yeah. I'm, I'm working. I'm working. I'm working on my talking right now, so this is perfect. <laughs> uh, but I sure, I'm sure there had to be a moment. You know, obviously, you've done a lot of great things already. It, you, if you, you, you had to have just to be speaking like this, you know, across the country. I mean, across the, the worldwide. You know, this is yeah. not an easy feat. Where was that point in your life that you're like, you know, this is it. Enough is enough. I'm getting out of being a, uh, you know, badass. Uh, badass law enforcer or in mm. law enforcement and this is it i'm done when was that point yeah uh that was february 2016 i was done oh wow yeah. so you came a long way real quick yeah again i know a little about positioning uh and how to you know really position yourself as the expert if you know your thing straight away so yeah pretty quick uh, turn around for me so yeah it's a uh, I wish it was kind of more of an elaborate story. It's such a great little um, little moment, but I just remember the actual physical moment for me. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'd been in law enforcement for 10 years and I'd worked for um, – so just to paint a picture for our US guys here, um, if your CIA and your FBI had a baby, it would be called in Australia, called the Australian Federal Police. 
So it was an intelligence organization that also did law enforcement stuff. So, you know, we did the roles of the CIA, but we did more focused on arrests, which is more the FBI's capability. So, yeah, we had we, – we made one organization that does the job of both. Oh, wow. So um, I worked in intelligence so um, and had worked in Intel for a very, very, very long time, and it's what I have degrees in, masters, all of that stuff. And so I'm a true nerd to the core with this sort of stuff. And I ended up working um, as a criminal intelligence analyst and had worked for 10 years to get to my dream job. I knew what I wanted to do and I was laser, I'm very laser focused when I get my mind on something. And I got to my job and I just remember sitting there doing paperwork and being like, this is not what I thought this was going to be. I was in a team of people that didn't like me. I didn't particularly like them. Mm -hmm. And I was starting to (laughs) realise due to doing stuff like improv that I actually could make a living and have a job that didn't feel soul-destroying by the end of the day. The thing is with law enforcement is no one's ever having a terrific day. If someone's been arrested, we're dealing with a crime which has massive impact into the community mm-hmm. because we're not just dealing with burglaries. We were dealing with things like drug trafficking, human trafficking, people smuggling. We were dealing with like high-end, like large human cost kind of offences this isn't a day you get to play with puppies every day. This isn't like you're having fun. You're not, no one's loving their job. And I remember just going, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm tired and getting home at the end of the day. And it was starting to feel like a struggle and getting out of bed was getting harder and harder. And I had never felt like that. So I did have a bit of an evaluation. I was like, I want to do something more creative. I want to actually do age of 30. I was like, I don't want to do this anymore which is a big statement when that's what you've done for 10 years. So everyone thought I was probably having a midlife crisis or something. For sure. Um, and was deeply concerned for me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and like, mm-hmm. are you all right? And I was like, no, I feel like quitting my job and my very stable six-figure income is a very good idea right now. So, yeah, I did. I was out. I just remember the day I was filling out paperwork and I was doing something called redacting, which is colouring in, highlighting things that you, that, you know, and deleting things that you can't have be seen. And being like, I didn't sign up for this. I thought I was going to be doing more than paperwork for, you know, 20 hours a week. And the rest is like lunch breaks and coffee breaks. And I was like, I don't want to do this anymore. How hard did it make it knowing that you spent so much time and all your money and effort? And I'm sure, you know, a lot of people looked up to you by getting there and accomplishing yeah. your dream. I think that um, I, I let I very early on. So when I made the decision quietly, I then sort of put in for, you know, the my workplace was really great about me taking what we call then a career break of just having six months off, having a bit of me time, which is not uncommon in stressful jobs like that. So I took six months off initially and then I was like, yeah, I'm never going back. Thank you. This has been great not coming back. Making the decision was easy. Telling other people was harder because people were um, – understandably concerned for me and a lot of people still have bought into the nine to five is what we have to do and this is what we have to do and have the career coming in and have the steady paycheck so it is difficult it is a really it's hard for other people to understand so I spent a lot of time justifying my own stuff the the next thing um there were two things that someone said to me that really kind of changed like immediately changed the way I thought about it one was I was talking about what if I make no money, what if I – and he looked me down in the eyes and he said to me, you used to work in a bar, right? And I was like, yeah, I backpack around Europe. That's how I how I made money. Like it's how I traveled Europe was pouring beer. And he's like, just because you did something else doesn't mean you can't go back and do that. The only thing that would stop you doing that is your ego. You can get a job anywhere. There's a lot of money to be made if you're willing to do work anywhere at all. Just to get some money in the door, I was like – what a concept. Second thing that happened was I really kind of got an understanding that very quickly about just because I'd done something for 10 years doesn't mean I have to continually do that for another 10. Mm -hmm. And I really liken it to dating someone that's not right for you, but you stay in it because you've already been there so long. And I was like, I would never be okay with that. And um, I really realized that and what most people – are still, I guess, trying to figure out is that, like, this is not a dress rehearsal. One shot. This is all we get, right? It is. And on my deathbed, I'd never wanted to wonder what if I'd given it a go. 
and I have such you have such a finite window to give anything a go before you have to, you know, fully adult. And I didn't have kids at home, and I had a supportive partner, and I was like, you know what? It's now or never. I'm actually never going to get to do this if there's another mm-hmm. chance. Mm-hmm. So you know, and I think one of the big reasons that I've had the success that I've had is I went all in. There was none of this. I'm going to half do it. I'm going to give it a go. Like I was like, no, hundred percent. Let's go. I'm all in, and I worked harder than any other person that I knew. To this day, I still work harder than most other people. That's amazing, and I I fully believe it. Just checking out, just just been following you for the past month or so. And once again, everybody tuning in, that's Jemima Ashley. You can ch- uh, find her, check the website jemimaashley.com or Instagram, Facebook. You got an AU after the Jemima Ashley. Uh, definitely, definitely a great story here and. And I could I could just see how passionate you are about you know what you're doing and and where you're at and I could really relate. I had a similar situation where I kind of used up all my vacation time I had saved up. I went on a backpacking trip by myself. I you know went through camping and hiking and stuff all alone. And I had those moments kind of where it was like picturing the same kind of things you're talking about the deathbed or just this is my only chance. Like yeah, it's. Not to say it's, that I people, not to say they can't do it when they're older. You could, but it only gets harder and harder. And I think it's really, um, I think people go, I'm um, having a bit of a crisis of it. I kind of look at it as a bit of a liberation. Like you're, you know, switching off from the matrix and being like, actually, maybe everything that we've been told is a lie here. Mm-hmm. I don't have to do it. And here's the thing. Again, we talked about this earlier. The the buying for entrepreneurship is so little these days. You just have to have a good idea and work your butt off to make it happen. Like, I don't believe in hustle, but I truly believe in the grind. The re- again, the reason that I've had success is I've been consistent every day, doing work, getting it done, working a little bit harder, working that extra hour, changes the ball game completely. And it's 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 honestly just math. If you work fifty hours a week and I work sixty, who's going to get ahead quicker? It's math. I'm doing ten hours extra work a week. So it's like 500 hours a year. That's incredible. And even if I get like sick for a few weeks, it really adds up and it adds up so quickly. It's that extra hour. It's that extra email. It's getting up half an hour to an hour earlier. It's that simple stuff every day on repeat. The really unsexy stuff is what wins business. Mm -hmm. What would you tell people that are big proponents of, you know, work less, but work uh, smarter? You know, like those 10 hour work week things you hear, for example. Oh, all oh. for it. Totally all for it. But you've got to pay your dues first. You can't just work 10 hours and work, walk away. They're, those people who are purporting that mm-hmm. truly have made it work. And I want to transition to that in the next couple of years. You cannot, no, I mean, this like actually, literally, you are just unable to work and 100% for a long period of time. You can knock it out for 6, 12, 18 months definitely, but when we start hitting the two, three, four year mark, you can't keep working at that level without doing serious damage to your health. I agree. And that's why, yeah, you need to have, and that's why, that's why we work these hours. I'm not doing this forever. I want to do this so I can actually kind of have a bit of a rest now, work, work my butt off, take two weeks or three weeks off at Christmas, actually just literally do nothing, mm-hmm. do what, you know, I've heard about this thing called Netflix. I'm looking forward to checking it out. <laughs> So I get to have this actual time That's nice. off. That's really nice. Yeah. Yeah. And then, um, you know, create something once you've got the reputation, once you've done the hard yards. Mm-hmm. You don't get to just do the 10-hour week, work week straight away. You have a lot of work that goes into the weeks before that. So people that buy into the, oh, I can just work 10 hours a week, you can, but there's a lot of work that goes into that first. Otherwise, you know, it's the equivalent of doing the 40-hour work week, right? Yeah, it's crazy. I almost have, feel like I'm not at the same timetable as you. I started a little bit later. But mm. I'm getting there too, where I was like going at it for 60, 80 hours, maybe even more, you know, maybe hundred hour. Like I was working every single day, no matter what. And I'm at the mm. point now where you, you really can't keep doing that 24 seven. You got to throw in these, this me time. You got to throw in, you know, as bad as I, I always used to preach against like Netflix or watching things, but honestly, once in a while, it's not the worst thing once in a while. Like if No, and just... it's it's not every day. This is again, yeah. it's a numbers game. When people say, you know, I've got a friend of mine who's always whinging they have no money and yeah, if you ask like have you watched the new Orange is New Black season and guarantee she's seen it and she's oh, seen yeah. it twice and I was like, That's you know, I, I got sucked into 
you know, I'm joking about Netflix. I've clearly watched it. Um, and there are some shows in there that I do what I call intentional watching because I used to do pretend watching where I'd have my laptop and I'd be responding to emails and I'd be watching TV at the same time. I was doing neither of these things. I wasn't relaxing. I wasn't just getting sucked into the TV. And I certainly wasn't working because I was half assing it at best. Mm-hmm. So now I do like intentional watching. I sit down and watch shows like The Good Place. Anyway, I had a day where I took a day off and I had had a fairly massive headache for the day. And I was like, my body is physically telling me it now. And I get better at reading the cues as you go along. I'm going to watch some Netflix, turned it on. And it just, you know how it does an auto start? Of like some shows. I hate it, that. <laughs> yeah, it starts uh, in Halloween. It's around Halloween. It sucked me into a TV show called Sabrina, which is a ripoff of Sabrina the Teenage Witch. It's a remake, but very dark. Three hours later, I emerged from three episodes, and I was like, "How many episodes are there? There's like 15 of them." I did the math. That's 15 hours. That's that I that's and a it lot. goes like 58 hours, and I went 58 minutes per episode, and I was like, "That's 15 hours. It's my whole day," and I was like, "I'm fine with this." But here's the thing, I'm going to com- I'm gonna control it because the other dangerous thing Netflix does is do that thing of just going to start the next episode. Yep. Yep, they're good. Yeah. They are back, good. <laughs> back in my day, we used to have to get up and change the DVD. So. Change the tape. Yeah, yeah, or, get up. Yeah, I am of that age it? group. Or, yeah, definitely. And you had to rewind it as well. Otherwise, yes. someone would yell at you. Oh, yeah, or it was an additional fee, right? Extra $5 yeah. if it wasn't rewinded or something. <laughs> Yeah, and you also put them in that machine and three seconds later it come out. You're like, that was not worth $5. You and I both know that. Right, right. Do you feel that there was a moment, there had to be you know, a breaking point, something that there, there was a mistake you made in this in this journey right now that had to be made? Like you fell down pretty hard, something that even though we could hear about it, we still need to go through it. Some, did you have a moment like that recently? Yeah, all the time. I don't try when people are like, Oh, have you ever failed? I was like, I fail all the time. And it's simply because failure is part of this journey. It's not something that should be avoided. It's just, it's literally just part of the world that we live in right now. And if you're an entrepreneur and you're not failing, you aren't trying enough stuff. Um, yeah, there's a couple of really big failures I had quite publicly. Um, the, one of the biggest ones that I had was I was, um, in a podcast called The Business Experiment. We did The Business Experiment. Uh, sorry, it was a fairly significant podcast. It got a lot of followers. We had, we were everywhere for about two years, and specifically in Australia, but we're in over 70 countries. Really? So, um, yeah, it grew really quickly, um, I, which was incredible. I'm so happy you got into this because I searched your podcast and I specifically mm. didn't bring it up, but now I, I, am, I have been burning to ask, where is it now? What's, yeah, this is so, probably, yeah, uh, right. yeah, so uh, we did the business experiment for 18 months um, and then called it at the end of last year. So um, in 20, end of 2017, it wrapped up and it was what, what people would explain as extremely counterintuitively because we were like at the height of – height of our success we were you know riding this massive wave and we were just like we are done here and the biggest mistake in that we did a few things one is um we bought our own bullshit so people were telling us how great we were and we were like of course we are we're amazing and we kind of bought into that a little bit and then had you know a few ego blows come after that i will never do that again the second thing that we did was we didn't really create a really solid sales funnel at the end of that which was a massive oversight on our behalf we started a podcast without realizing we needed to have that um but the other thing is we just underestimated the amount of work that would go into it so as a profile building exercise it was phenomenal as a sales exercise, we didn't think it through. Also, I wasn't really coaching then. I wasn't really, I didn't really have a clear product. I was just building my profile. It was a great tool, but as a as a sales thing, it didn't maybe go as well as I would have hoped. Have you thought about revisiting that area? Yeah, um, I would love to do another podcast. I would love to sort of build up, um, you know, that kind of thing again. It was magic. So and we're very aware of that. And Siobhan, my co-host and I are still really good friends. We went to kinder, like um, preschool together. Like we've known each other for a lifetime and we loved it, but we just didn't really think it through before we started. And we, we did what I think most people and, the, and this was a big lesson for me and it's a huge takeaway that I carry now and any client that I work with and all of my clients now will be able to 
quote this literally to you, but it was just, I didn't, we thought too small going in. We were like, it'll be great if our parents listen. It'll just document our journey. It'll be great. Everyone listened but our parents. (laughs) So it became this running joke about, um, you know, our families weren't listening. We knew they weren't listening, but they were like, oh, that thing you're doing on the computer. And we had this amazing following and people were starting to recognize us on the street. It was totally foreign. I'm from law enforcement, right? I tried to stay in the shadows. So it was incredible. But at the same time, it was a little bit overwhelming. So it was, we just didn't plan for it to ever be big. And that's a huge mistake because it, we immediately, it immediately outgrew us. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I don't think we'll do that thing again. I think definitely we've talked about what it would take to revive it um, and what that would look like. And we know that we still have listeners out there. We, You know, I got an email the other day, um, sorry, a messenger on Facebook saying, hey, did you know that you guys are in Marie Claire, the magazine? And I was like, no, because eventually media start telling you if they're writing stories about you. They just go and do it, right? <laughs> So I thought it was pretty funny. <laughs> like I was wow. like, and they're like, oh, listen to the podcast here. I'm like, we finished this almost 12 months ago and it's still getting media traction and people are still finding it. It's evergreen. So yeah, it wrapped up the end of last year quite counterintuitively, I think, for a lot of people. But what felt like a really good fit for us, we needed to know when to leave the party and it was definitely time. Okay. Well, that's that's so interesting to hear. A lot of people are like trying to hop on board right now and riding the wave and going with it. And you've already kind of been there, done that. I'm curious. Oh, it's incredible. Curious yeah, it's amazing. I'm curious to uh, to see what happens next and what you might... If you want to talk afterwards, we could talk. <laughs> and now on to our listeners' favorite segment of the show. Welcome to the round with no name because they're all taken. This round, you get exactly five seconds to initiate an answer. We don't want you thinking too much about it. We just want you to kind of go with the flow and spit out what you think first. Okay. Even if it's subconsciously. Even if you fall asleep and you're doing it. (laughs) Okay. All right. Let's go. Let's do it. Favorite book. Uh, Position Me by Jemima Ashley. (laughs) If it actually answers anything by Gary Vaynerchuk. (laughs) Okay. Butter. No. I mean, it's, it's fine. It's allowed. Stranded on an island. What is the one item you want with you? Uh, All the food and water I can carry. And maybe my husband, because he would actually know how to get us out of that situation. He he could carry the food, right? That's actually a really good idea. I didn't have to carry anything. I just walk around and like swan around the ocean and wish I had my phone with me. How do you drink your coffee? Um, I have iced lattes, so I'm a bit precious. I like cold coffee, uh, with milk. So iced latte. Okay. Is there a specific one you drink every day? Like you just need it? Oh, two shots of coffee and just cold milk and then ice over top of it. Favorite thing in the world. Okay, okay. If What is the one item that you want, that you need, you need with you every day that makes you different? It could be something you drink, you eat, you would just wear it on you. One thing. Yeah. Um, oh, uh, vitamin supplements. If I don't have those, I just literally, my brain doesn't work as well as I wish it does. <laughs> is there a specific, yeah, or- like, is there like some powdered or some brand you use? Oh, um, I take uh, just actual natural vitamins. So um, it's a product called Juice Plus and it's like berries, it's greens and uh, ver- it's got a vegetable, a berries one and a, a fruit one as well. And it's just a supplement that I take and legitimately feel better when I've had it. And I, I didn't have it yesterday and I could tell today. I was like, I'm feeling a bit sluggish. Oh my goodness, I didn't have that. I'm just not getting the right amount of food at the right time. I also forget to eat a lot. It's a real problem. Um, or, or my Fitbit because that reminds me I have to actually stand up occasionally and not get stuck that into thing, work. That thing. Oh. Who, uh, who is or has been your greatest mentor? Um, Gary Vaynerchuk. He's amazing. Is entrepreneurism a fad? No, I think it's a revolution. I think we don't need nine to five jobs anymore. I think we can happily bail on those. Um, And I think workplaces are yet to figure out that we don't need them anymore, more than they need us. What is, uh, if there's one thing that you can start up right now, if you had unlimited amount of money, you got, you hit the jackpot and you could start up any business today, what would it be? Um, I would start a school for entrepreneurs that allows me to get the message out. 95% of businesses are failing in the first five years. And I think a huge part of that is because we're getting the wrong education at the wrong time. I would start an entrepreneur school. How do you feel about voice? 
specifically podcasts, audiobooks? Um, eighty percent of the content that we're going to consume in the next five years will be in voice con will be voice or video. So it's the, it's the revolution. Get on board. If you had to choose one, voice or video, which one would you start, would you go and go all in with? Voice, because you can make video to go with that, but you can't do the opposite. <laughs> all right. Well, you're there. I'm here. We survived the round. <sighs> <laughs> that was really stressful. I was like, no one told me that was coming. That was great though. I saw, I saw. I hope I didn't stress you out too much, but yeah, it was that's just a good. moment of I got oh, your blood was... I got the blood flowing, got you thinking. Yeah. Hopefully. And well it's done. early. It's early where you're at, so now you I'm good. Uh, I'm now, good. I'm now gonna keep drinking to go. my ice latte. Now you're ready to go. Oh, that's what it is. Okay. Well, if I see you next time, I hope to get a nice latte. So I'll be yeah, uh, I'll oh, definitely I'm gonna keep you to it if I ever see you. Hell yeah, Starbucks do them try. and they're um they they are very sweet, but okay. they are delicious. <laughs> You're saying that entrepreneurism is not a fad. Um, why do you think that, especially with so many people out there just saying they're entrepreneurs left and right? Well, there's a reason we're having a 95% failure rate. So um, it's because people think entrepreneur. So entrepreneurship has made to look real sexy. Mm -hmm. You go on Instagram now, no one is posting their failures. We're not talking about the, you know, the un the unkempt hair where, you know, I met someone in Los Angeles a while ago who they ran a business where they just had planes that sat on tarmacs. That was their job. They owned a plane. They had a photographer and like a, an attractive stewardess or a steward steward. So you had could male or female, depending on what kind of model that you wanted. They would dress up in like an outfit and they would do a photo shoot with you on a tarmac. You never left the airport. You sat on the tarmac the entire time and you had one hour to do whatever you wanted on the plane, right? With a photographer on hand. They were one of the fastest growing part of LAX, that business. Wow. People were paying $200, $300, $400 to be there mm -hmm. to have this photo shoot and this attractive model to feed them food and look like they're flying around the world rather than doing the goddamn work to make that happen, make that actual pos actually possible where that's what's happening. And I think this is what entrepreneurship has become. We want to have 100,000 Instagram followers. I don't care if you've got 10. If you've got 10 engaged people, that is way better than 100,000 people who are buying nothing and just liking your photo and keep going. Mm -hmm. I would rather have 70 people who follow everything that I do and, you know, I record, I wrote a book and they buy it. I record an, an episode of a podcast where it's just me playing the kazoo and they listen to it. I am in. Like, I want that over the, you know, I care about the depth of the people rather than the how many the width is, is irrelevant. So I think what's happened is things like Instagram, Facebook, make this look sexy. It's not. It is coffee. It is It is not sleeping. It is having a cold every now and again. It's wearing yourself down. It's doing a lot of work. It's literally time travel and chatting to someone first thing in the morning in Australia and then having back-to-back -back interviews for the rest of the day. I love my job. I would rather I do this over everything else. What people don't realize when they start entrepreneurship and become entrepreneurs, that it's hard work. It sounds really sexy, but it's a lot of hard work. And that's where we're seeing this failure rate. I don't think it's a fad because the people who are good at it and the people that are growing, they want to help other people. I think true entrepreneurs really want to raise, raise other people up and bring other people into the success. And I think what we're going to see is that businesses are going to have to catch on. If you work for a business, you are helping someone else build their own dream. You are not building your own. And I think we're about to see people realize really quickly that the right tools are available for you and you no longer have to work for somebody else. I was going to ask you if you had any closing thoughts, but after that, I, I mean, I don't know if there's a better way to really – you know, go yeah, no, that's it. Mic drop. I'm out. <laughs> yeah, I just this is truly what I think. I think great. we're gonna see yeah, a higher rate of failure. Um we have such a high rate because people are like, I'm doing the thing. Oh, the thing is actually hard. Damn it. Like I'm just gonna go take photographs on a plane. You know, do that if that's your jam. I'm not criticizing people that do that. But at the end of the day, you know, this is where the business is one, one hour at a time. I can't say it better. I cannot say it better. Jemima Ashley, everybody, be sure to follow her on Instagram, Facebook, check out her website. Um, with, with your book out, is there any uh, 
Is there any special promo or anything going on with the book right now? Which is yes. a number one bestseller. Yeah, and, that was incredible. We did that in well, 90 minutes. So again, the people like, again, I care about the width, not the like how like I can want, go deep, get the people who will buy anything that you sell. Um, yeah, so my book came out only a week and a half ago. So it's on there now on Amazon. It's a couple of dollars. I think it's $2 American USD. So jump on there and go and find that. You can buy a hard copy version and I will sign it and ship it to you. I will be all about that. And I've sent you guys will be able to find the link here on Mary's page. Um, the other thing is I've got a ton of free, free resources on my website. So go and check those out. Heaps of ways of t- how to position yourself today and things that you can implement in your business to make more money as today. My why of being in business is this 95% has to end. We have to get the right people and the right tools at the right time. And so that's, you know, all these free downloadables all aim at doing that. Yep. I couldn't agree more. That's everybody that's positioned me. If you want to search for it on Amazon, uh, they got it available there. And you could just check out your website for uh, everything else, right, Ash? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, JemimaAshley.com. It's been a pleasure have you pleasure having you on. I uh, oh, look, thank fo- you so much. I look forward to hearing from you down the road, and I'm sure we'll check in and kind of see where things are at, and maybe one day we'll have that ice latte together. All about that. Let's do it. That is all for this episode of Boss to Boss. Your next step is to visit boss2boss.com, where you will find proven techniques followed by professionals to help you make that next step. Again, that is boss, the number two, boss.com. And remember, the time is now.